Good afternoon and welcome. Welcome to Arts Together. Our discussion today, we're looking at planning the 2021 dance school year. We have an incredibly dynamic online panel for you today of local dance and education leaders who will share their ideas and strategies for planning and reimagining the upcoming year during the pandemic and of course recovery. I'm going to get started right away. I just wanna share a few resources with you as people are trickling in. It's one o'clock right on the dot. Uh, we have two new resources that are available straight from the directory of the Network of Maryland Fine Arts Supervisors, many of whom are here today. We are so lucky in Maryland to have such a generous and um, brilliant team of supervisors that are supervising arts education programs throughout the state. And they have collaborated together to create two unique documents. The first is Arts Together, which is planning guidance for arts educators in Maryland public schools in response to COVID-19 and recovery. The second is the social emotional learning through the arts, which is a crosswalk of the social emotional learning competencies as defined by Castle, with arts learning experiences in all five arts disciplines. So music, media arts, dance, theater, and visual art as well. Please make sure to check out both of these documents. If you have questions on how to better serve your students in the weeks ahead, months ahead, um, both of these documents will be really key. You can download them on our website, and I'm sure uh, in a minute, um, my colleague Lillian Jacobson will, uh, will magically pop a link in the chat um, where you can download these documents. They've been downloaded in 45 states and uh, many countries all around the world already. So Maryland is proud to be a leader. Additionally, the Crosswalk um, SEL document can be downloaded. It was published this Monday and has already received hundreds of readership um, and downloads. So we're very excited about that. In addition, we are so excited to be able to next Friday open up registration for our Summer Professional, Le professional Learning Series for Arts Educators. This summer, we have 128 hours of professional learning in social emotional learning, mental health, anti-bias arts education, culturally responsive arts education, building relationships online, using collaborative structures, implementing student voice and agency into your work. So if you are an arts educator or an arts integration classroom teacher and you're looking for professional learning or a fine arts supervisor, we have over 126 hours led by the absolute best facilitators here in Maryland, in addition to some um, some special guests from outside of our state who I think people will be very excited to, uh, to work with. And now I'm gonna bring up our first panel. We have the incredible Tamisha Kennard Richardson from Prince George's County. And we're going to come up and she's gonna, gonna bring her up to the presentation area. And we're gonna talk a little bit about Looks like I lost her here. There we go, found her. We're gonna talk about uh, the school year so far. Since March, teachers have been just working so hard and creatively, in addition to hard, but they've been working creatively to, um, to provide instruction and continuity of learning for students. Hi, Tamisha, how are you today? I'm doing well, doing well, thank you. Awesome, fantastic. Well, we're gonna dive right in. So due to COVID-19 back in March, there was the rapid closure of Maryland schools and local school systems throughout Maryland launched continuity of learning plans. The arts are essential content in Maryland and are a part of a well-rounded education for all Maryland students. Tamisha, what are the benefits of dance education continuing even during continuity of learning? Okay, so I have a lot to share about this, so just bear with me, okay? Good. <laughs> so my question and response is, why not dance? Dance is the expression of oneself on one's deepest level. Dance is an expression of life's experiences, and when there are no words, 
there's always dance. Mm. In the state of Maryland, students have had an extraordinary opportunity to be exposed to dance in public education. This does not take place all over our country. So we are very, very fortunate. So Absolutely. Some, of the highlights, some of the highlights of distance learning for dance education were that more and more students and teachers had great opportunities to be exposed to take master classes with professional teaching artists, wow. as well as view full length dances from professional dance companies. Many dance companies have never shared their entire repertoire um, virtually due to copyright legalities. Mm -hmm. So I thought this was an excellent opportunity for our students to experience dance in a much broader context. Absolutely. Um, two of our elementary Prince George's County Public School dance educators, they were invited to present dance lessons via the Prince George's County Public School television channel, Mr. Bayardo Martinez and Mrs. Amanda Standard. For, student, for elementary students who may not have had any technology at home. It was also an amazing opportunity to showcase dance and how young students can engage with movement within their own homes. I was very impressed with how creative my dance educators lessons were and how many accolades they actually received from other non arts <laughs> educators from across Prince George's County. Um, the next thing is I will never underestimate the power of instructional support. Before this year, I actually functioned pretty much as an office of one. Mm. With growing dance programs, the work was becoming unmanageable. Now I work with the best dance education team in the world. I have the privilege of having a dance resource teacher along with a dance mentor teacher who support the dance educators in various capacities. So at the beginning of the shutdown, each content across the county was tasked with completing a continuity of learning plan, including virtual lessons that teachers can access and use immediately. So my team of rock stars, Jackie Martin and mm. Jennifer Eggleston, yeah. they rolled up their sleeves and went to work drawing from a variety of digital and hard copy resources as well as good old fashioned creative instruction. We are all very well versed as a team. Jennifer has taught elementary as well as middle school, uh -huh. taught middle school and Jackie taught predominantly high school. Oh, that's great. So by putting our heads together, we were able to brainstorm and create a plan that teachers found easy to follow and made dance education accessible to all students in a virtual environment. So this right here is key. I'm very, very thankful that Prince George's County Public Schools, we did a textbook adoption in 2018 and opted for not only a class set of traditional hard copy dance textbooks, but we have also had all of our books digitally. So we have wow. every textbook, every dance te textbook digitally. This made distance learning, distance learning, excuse me, more malleable for teachers and students as they had information that was familiar to them at their disposal. So for students that potentially didn't have technology resources readily available to them at home, on Friday, March 13th, Mrs. Richardson asked her teachers to discreetly survey their students and provide them with a hard copy of a textbook to take home prior to the COVID-19 shutdown. Oh, that's great. Yes, yeah, so on the flip side, some challenges we faced were, my main concern for teachers doing physical activity and movement was pretty much the potential for any type of injury or harm mm -hmm. to students. Right. Yeah. I instructed teachers early on to be very cognizant of the types of movements they would be requesting of students in terms of performance delivery. Mm. Many movements became more stationary for students and challenged students thinking and creativity to literally think inside the box. <laughs> Without direct in-person instruction and correction, there would be more opportunities for students to execute movements incorrectly. Mm. Um, that has been my biggest fear throughout this entire COVID-19 adjustment and journey. The other challenge was and I'm certain that it is not exclusive to PGCPS students, but some students would log on to the virtual classroom 
and engage with the learning, however, chose not to do or submit the assignments, which made no sense to me. Um, this became difficult and discouraging for teachers as they worked diligently to prepare virtual dance lessons. There was also a huge technology learning curve for a few of my dance educators and students. Right. Yeah. However, they got on board and were successful in sharing instruction via Zoom, Google Classroom, Screencastify, and many other platforms to engage students learning. So that's pretty much what we have been working on through the first half of the pandemic. And hopefully we will be a little bit more equipped and prepared if we have to be back in this position again. In the fall. That is an incredible body of work. I am so impressed, but not surprised at all um, by how uh, responsive you and your team were able to be to students, to teachers, and to families to make sure that dance education continued. Will you talk a little bit about the, um, I loved um, in the very beginning of your message, you talked a little bit about the arts community opening their doors and opening resources um who were some of those uh those folks that you um saw that did that and and you know where, what were some of the, the programs that students really enjoyed participating in so um alvin ailey american dance theater they're a big company that um, actually opened their repertoire and so you were able to see full-length dances as well as dance here harlem uh, Paul Taylor, just to name a few. I even had dance teachers telling me they're taking dance class with professional artists from California. Mm -hmm. I've seen um, dance artists from Japan, even though there's a time difference, I'm still sharing it with students. Right. But just to actually say that they took a class under someone. Debbie Allen actually taught class throughout the week. and I took Debbie Allen's classes. <laughs> Those were amazing, amazing. Absolutely. So just just the simple fact that our students had the exposure and were able to actually participate says a lot. And they could actually put that on their resume. Absolutely. It's really, really, really a, a, a silver lining in a very, of course, a pandemic, a, a global crisis. Um, but we've seen the generosity of artists and arts communities. Uh, we've seen the collaboration of, of education teams and, and arts educators working across silos to really work together. It's that's That part of this has been amazing and something I'm sure we will carry forward with vigor um, after this is all finished. I have one last question for you. So, so many artists um, have been using this time to share their stories and skills with the world. Uh, and so some of your favorite uh, dance companies you just mentioned um, and many others. I got a chance to dance along with uh, DJ D-Nice. I was in a dance room with Michelle Obama, right? I'll never forget that, right? That was incredible. And so they're also helping us cope with the uncertainty of these present times. How are students in Prince George's County using creative or artistic responses to share stories? Okay, so got a couple things to share here as well. Wonderful. One of the biggest challenges we faced in general, you know, is that, and I'm sure every dance teacher can attest to this and every student can attest to this, is the lack of space at home to mm -hmm. physically move. However, I will share that many students surprised me and use random spaces and they made it work. So in dance, we call it site specific work. Some of the virtual student performances were actually done outdoors by students, which gave them ample space to move freely. And I've also seen works presented in students' living rooms, in their bedroom spaces. Wow. And, and it's interesting just to see how they utilize the space that's provided. So that takes true critical thinking skills as a choreographer. Um, I've also shared, like I mentioned before, as many professional um, masterclass opportunities with teachers and students to partake in during the shutdown. I think this opportunity has sparked a lot of creativity and allowed dancers to see dance, even as a traditional art form, that it can be adaptable, done by anyone and done anywhere. And lastly, students have used movement in unique ways to express what's actually going on in social justice across America right mm -hmm. now, as well as using their voice to tap into their own social emotional state to release many of their thoughts and feelings through dance. I have definitely been very impressed by the work that our students and teachers have been producing during this period, because as they show, as they say, the show must go on. Bravo. 
Well, thank you so much, Tamisha, for your leadership and your visionary leadership. And um, it's always great to hear the wonderful things that you're doing with your team in Prince George's County. Thank you for sharing this with the with the statewide place today. And um, we're grateful for your for your participation this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Awesome. All right. Next up, we're going to bring two other supervisors up, two new folks. We're going to bring up Sonia Sinkowski from Baltimore County Public Schools and Nicole Deming from Anne Arundel County Public Schools. And they're going to talk to us about the Arts Together Report. Hello, Nicole. Hello, Sonia. Hello. Thank you both. Hi there. Ah, all right. So the Maryland, the MSDE Maryland Together Report shares that Maryland schools will look very different in fall 2020. And arts instruction is an essential part of a public school education in Maryland schools and should and must continue in distance learning, hybrid learning, and in-person learning models. Our network of Maryland fine arts supervisors has prepared a collaborative document to support fine arts programs in Maryland public schools. And our next two guests are committee members from the Arts Together document project. This document is meant to be shared with all arts education stakeholders and used to launch arts educators specifically into planning for the year ahead with the understanding that each local school system will have its own procedures and models based on the nature of this pandemic. So I'm going to pull up our beautiful executive summary and make it kind of large for a few while we talk to you both. And I'm gonna start with, who am I gonna start with? Should I start with Sonia? Thank you very much. <laughs> so our first tenet here is that fine arts educators should continue to teach in their content. Sonia, will you talk to us about why that's so important? Yes, absolutely. Um, through the committee work, this was one point that came up many times over and over again. Um, so we felt that it should be the first thing mentioned in the executive summary. And really it's reiterating the fact that our uh, dance educators should continue to teach dance in whatever environment that may be. Um, so in, in looking at the reopening of schools, you know, we took a lot of safety and logistical concerns and put those into the document. But we also knew that this document needed to be an advocacy tool to continue um, having our arts teachers teaching in their discipline, to be able to maintain that continuity of instruction, but also expand it if needed um, in whatever environment we will be in. Um, and as many have probably seen in the news, there were stories coming out about arts teachers being cut or asked to do different roles um, during this um, time of remote learning. Um, we heard of adjunct faculty who were looking at not returning to university positions. There was a lot of um, concern and tension around that point. And we wanted to make it very clear that the recommendation is that our teachers continue to teach um, in their areas that they are certified in their assigned um, content. And also looking ahead, we knew that student to teacher ratios would possibly be reduced in order to maintain physical distancing. And we didn't want um, any creative problem solving to go on that included moving our arts teachers out of their disciplines to, ex to help with making those student ratio, teacher ratios smaller. Um, so we're certainly on board with physical distancing and smaller class sizes as needed, but that should also be happening in our dance classrooms instead of eliminating our dance classrooms. And as we all know, the arts are so integral to adapting back to um, a sense of self, a sense of normal, especially during these times. So we want to really just drive home that the dance is one way that we can do that. It is a vehicle. It helps the whole building with setting the tone and bringing students back into the fold and with socializing. And we know our students need that. And our classroom teachers can also benefit from those practices and leaning into arts integration. Absolutely. Leaning into arts integration for educators as, as a method even of just healing, right? Bringing a healing centered approach to your non-arts content areas in addition to all the critical thinking that occurs when we dance and uh, learn through movement. So mm -hmm. thank you so much. That was great. Nicole, curricular yeah. options for all artistic processes can be delivered in all environments. Why is it so important that we make sure that arts uh, programs, specifically dance programs, maintain all four artistic processes in, in the instruction delivery? 
Great. So Sonia and I had a lot of very rich conversations around this and um, you know, we feel very strongly that all four artistic processes can be and should be included in any platform for dance education. Um, we discussed that, you know, some strategies and considerations um, in moving forward if we find ourselves in this situation again, um, possibly if we're in person, you know, having kind of a 75% focus on performing and creating, 25 on responding and connecting, and then kind of flipping those percentages if and when we would have to go to online learning again. And obviously at no point should any process be discounted or not included. Um, we also talked about, you know, it's really important that we're including those standards in our lesson planning. So for this summer, you know, local school systems evaluating their existing curriculums and kind of having a step ahead plan for um, making sure all of their lessons have an e-learning um, friendly component to it. So making sure that's purposeful instruction, backwards planning uh, with those assessments in mind um, so that we are prepared for any future adjustments if needed. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. Sharing student work continues with modifications for digital platforms or physical dis distancing is uh, the third tenet here. And why is it important that we continue to invest in students exhibiting their work? Well, um, first and foremost, you know, dance is a performing arts discipline. And so we wanted to really drive home um, with teachers and with uh, um, administrators and with the general public that we um, as as dance teachers are able to continue um, performing and sharing work. And while that may look um, a lot different for the fall and potentially you know, on into the spring where we may not have large performances or in-person performances, it's yet to be unknown, that we still can find ways to share student work um, and to show student work. And so you're know, looking at creative ways we can use digital platforms while that brings challenges. It's also an opportunity to look for different ways and different types of work that we can share. Um, one of the schools in Anne Arundel County Public Schools, Annapolis High School, did a great um, distance learning project during this um, current uh, semester that we just finished that included um, pictures of famous uh, images from different uh, famous dance companies that the students then embodied. So they took that image and then tried to recreate it in their own likeness. And I so saw that was one of the They were wonderful. It was yeah, a lot of very famous choreographers. And, and that's a, a great way to transition into a digital platform and to show work a little differently than we normally would have. And it was very clear to see that the students were invested, that they were um, you know, creating that work, and it still had a, a, a nice impact um, as a final product. So we're just encouraging teachers to think outside the box, um, to continue to share student work. Uh, we know that engages our community, engages our parents, engages the people who are wanting to see what our programs are doing. And we certainly didn't want teachers to feel that they should just spend an entire school year just saying no to performances. So um, this is just encouraging a different ways to share that work and to continue to do that. Um, you know, we also thought of things like if we are working in person, that that may mean we have smaller cast works or that we're double casting pieces just to maintain that idea of smaller numbers and more separation, but still um, finding that creative way to get students performing. That's fantastic. That's great. You know, uh, we obviously we as Maryland educators, we all value the process over the product, but the product is still important and often brings our communities together and gives students a chance to sit back and reflect on their learning. Right. And so it's a really important part of art making and arts learning. Mm -hmm. And it provides that purpose for our students. That's something we wanted to, to continue as well. They look forward to the product, you know, the, the end. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I, I do want to um, give a shout out to um, can where can people find those photos of the dance of uh, those dancers that you mentioned are would they they're on Facebook, I guess, under the BCPS. No, right? well, they actually were shared through the Maryland Dance Education Association ah, we did right, sharing you. of and highlighting and elevating student work so they okay. can you can find them on the MDEA Facebook. Perfect. Thank you so much. I, I saw them yeah. and I clicked through several of them and I mm -hmm. thought, wow, these are so cool and dynamic. And I was so thrilled to see students. And I thought maybe even some educators, I'm not sure, um, uh, in some of those photos, but they were really, really strong. And another example of a static way that learning can still can continue mm -hmm. to occur. I, I thought it was really great, really great idea. All right, uh, Nicole, back to you. 
So we, we have realized and we're emphasizing here that teachers and staff will need training in the proper sanitization of materials and physical spaces. And uh, we want to make sure that that investment is being made throughout the state of Maryland. And, and why is that such a key element uh, of this report? Well, I think first we acknowledge that this is an evolving and fluid conversation for all of the arts disciplines at this point um, because you know everything is changing with CDC guidelines. Um, so we're kind of just leaning on that as far as you know what the future holds. Um, but as we talked, this Arts Together document is a guidance document and it's an advocacy tool. And you know the local school systems will obviously offer support um, for professional development for their teachers. You know of how to, if if and when we go back in the classroom, what that will look like and how it will look like um, how it will be different. So you know I think it's important that we understand it's going to look different moving forward, and um, it will become a new normal. Um, obviously, we're going to have to increase you know the wiping down of spaces regularly. Um, the question, you know, stands like whose responsibility? And I think at this point, you know, it's kind of an all hands on deck, you know, to make sure that we're following protocols. Um, as far as what spaces look like, I think it's really important that, you know, the supervisors in the, the different systems are providing visuals for our teachers of what the actual spaces will look like. We've talked about in the document, removing materials from the space um, that aren't being used at that time. So it's one less thing that, you know, a distraction for either our student to touch and it's out of the space. So it's not needing to be cleaned. Um, depending on the level of exposure, um, obviously maybe removing materials and resources as a whole and then integrating them back in, obviously with proper um, sanitization procedures. Um, also organized movement for students and staff in, in and outside of the classroom. How are we entering the room? How is that looking different? You know, we're gonna have to really be creative and think outside the box um, so that we have very clear guidelines. And that also goes back to, as we're introducing our classrooms in the fall, while typically we may bring our students in the room and we go over, this is where your shoes go, and this is how we sit in the circle, and this is how we go over the outcome. What other things do we need to implement that support this um, hygiene and sanitization that goes alongside of how do we start our classroom in the fall. So there's gonna be some added layers there and um, as local school systems, you know, will develop and work with our teachers so that everyone feels supported, number one, and that, you know, within their schoolhouse, they feel supported too, um, because those cleaning procedures are gonna take more time in between classes and, um, we are here to support that to make sure that they may need to go into the locker room, but they also need to clean their space. So how are we um, facilitating that timeline in between transitions as well? So um, I'm, I'm excited as far as the state organization and my local school system to work on how are we gonna provide PD for our teachers um, moving forward. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, Sonia, um, so it's so important that we support student engagement in and through the arts. What can we expect in that regard in the months ahead? Yeah, I think this is a really important point as we look to support the whole child. Um, and one of the recommendations coming out of this report is to really incorporate that social emotional learning. Um, certainly the arts naturally, um, and you know it's evident in the um, reports that are coming out, uh, provide social emotional learning just through the processes and the creative process, but that we also acknowledge that there's more that we can do to support students in this way so that the uh, student engagement through the arts happens as well as in the arts. This is also an opportunity to think about how we can bring students into the fold, as we mentioned, with reopening. Um, we we noticed you know, in remote learning that uh, it, our equity gaps um, widened, that there were cases when students, we, we lost students and we couldn't reach them um, in a remote environment as well as we could in in-person learning. And so we need to be aware of that. We need to try our best to advocate for those students, to look at ways to address those gaps, to minimize any barriers that we can for our students mm -hmm. so that the engagement piece can continue to happen, um, which is so important. 
Um, and, you know, we've recognized that the arts have really helped many of our students, many of our families, many humans to cope during the pandemic. And we want to continue for that to happen as we bring students into the classroom. So processing what's going on in the world through the arts and finding ways that we can use the arts as that tool, as that vehicle to um, speak to what's going on. And lastly, uh, just as we would in it, but pre-COVID, before we were um, in a pandemic situation, we wanna make sure that whatever we do is supported for all students. So looking at different ways we can support students' needs, provide that differentiation, look at the ways that we're delivering um, the, the learning piece so that all students feel supported and seen. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much. All right. Well, in closing, Nicole, will you tell us what else people can find in the Arts Together report? What else is in there? Of course. Of course. So it's um, in our dance section. You can find details on teaching and learning, um, maintaining distance, accommodations for smaller group sizes, which we touched a little bit on today, materials and supplies, um, more in-depth sanitization um, recommendations, staffing, scheduling, um, as Sonia discussed, small group and large group gathering suggestions, and then obviously professional learning. Awesome, fantastic. All right, I'm gonna bring up uh, our, another guest to join us here. And it is Darby Pack, the Maryland Academy of Dance. Find her here. And, oh, there she is, hold on. Somehow I'm, I'm having trouble finding her. Hold on one second. There we go. I think she's here. All right, cool. Great. So Darby is here from the Maryland Academy of Dance. She's the director. Um, that means we now have three Carver Center for Arts and Technology alums on the dais at the same time. So that's exciting. <laughs> <laughs> Mary Carey is somewhere th thrilled. So that's very cool. <laughs> yeah. uh -huh. All right. So what we've got, um, we're going to talk about performances. Hi, Darby. Good to see you. She'll be right back. So we're mm -hmm. going to talk about performances. Hey, Darby, how are you? Well, how are you? Hi, Nicole. Yeah, great. Hi, Did Darby. Darby. Yay. Did you hear me plug the Wildcats? Oh, <laughs> yes. Carter Wildcats. And I have a daughter who will be a Wildcat in a couple That's of right. Congratulations. <laughs> That's great. That's the best thing ever. I love that. <laughs> So Darby, um, will you tell us about um, about your dance school? You have a community dance school. What are the ways that you've been keeping students engaged um, through uh, with all this distance that is, uh, is, of course, necessary because of COVID? Yeah, so we have tried everything in the book. If there were uh, what to do during COVID, uh, to, you know, try this, uh, we've done that. We've tried everything. We had a tea party online for our preschool age we brought in a hip hop choreographer to do a hip hop class. We've done internet challenges. We have done coloring online on Sunday during church time to give parents a break. If you can think it, we have done it online. We have had yoga online. We have done everything outside of whatever box I thought was normal to keep our community engaged. We even did movie nights where we would uh, take pictures and do Netflix watch parties and pick up dance movie and parents would send in pictures of them tied into the bed with a headscarf on. It was just crazy and amazing. But, um, but if you can think about it, we have done it in order to keep them engaged. And this is outside of just our teaching schedule. We've played Family Feud in classes. We have done I Spy <laughs> with the preschool. We have just sat and talked some days because we understand the impact on their emotions. Um, but we have definitely done a little bit of everything. <laughs> it's amazing. I see so much of that engagement online i you know we all see you know how engaged your students are and your families and i think it's to be commended during this during this time all right nicole or sonia will you talk to us about mdea where you guys are also leaders there and what are the ways that you're planning for and reimagining the upcoming dance season so many student exhibitions that you guys put on I think mostly in the spring, in the winter, right? Right. So, um, you know, what yeah. can people expect from MDA? 
Nicole's giving me the look. All right. Yes. Okay. If I can take it. I, I was <laughs> just going to say we have, we currently have our, our spring, well, late winter spring events on the, on the books. Um, however, you know, as, as this evolves, we will adjust accordingly. And um, obviously our, our plan and hope is that they will be in person um, with modifications if needed or dictated to us. Um, but the goal is to have in person. And then if not, we will reimagine and reconvene as committees and adjust as needed. But um, we, we do not plan on hopefully eliminating any programs. We will find a new way because obviously um, the middle school showcase did not happen this year. And that was abrupt because we were in the midst of the strongest exposure rate of COVID and um, it just wasn't possible. But knowing, hopefully getting um, information in advance we will have that planning time to make sure um, our students are not, are providing that opportunity for our students. So that's fantastic. Do you want to plug a little bit about Deddy this summer? Sonia. I'll let Sonia do that. <laughs> sure. Sure. Yes. Yeah. So the Dance Educator Training Institute, which typically is an in-person professional development, a week of professional development, um, and it's typically has been held at UMBC. It is going virtual, so it will be um, half day offerings, August 17th, 18th and 19th. And um, those offerings will be from 12 noon till 330. And we're doing um, shorter sessions, so 50 minute sessions um, on the hour, every hour and then finishing with kind of a recap or synthesis um, from three to 3.30 every day. And we're really excited about it. And the schedule will come out very soon so that people can engage with one session during that time, or if they want to be a part of the entire three-day virtual DETI, that would be amazing. So um, I'm happy to put a link to where the schedule will live and where that registration will live. I'll just put that in the chat. That's perfect. That's perfect. And when, it's, when the schedule's ready, it will share it in our newsletter. So we'll just stay in contact so we can get all that information out to teachers in that way too. On our that media. sounds great. That sounds um, wonderful. Fantastic. Um, I love to hear about professional learning. We're going to talk about professional learning in the next piece, but I wanted to give you guys a chance to talk about Debbie. So Darby, Darby, will you tell us, how are you guys, what are you guys doing at the Maryland Academy of Dance? How are you imagining um, the summer and, and next fall? Um, what will dance look like um, over at MAD? Okay. So we have decided to extend our season. Our show was supposed to be tomorrow. Um, and so there's a little bit of a funeral happening emotionally for all of us as our timelines remind us of this season last year and all the fun things that we did. Um, but I've also talked to my parents about the opportunity to create something amazing in spite of the circumstances. So we are going to do a documentary and we are going to document what has been happening in our own MAD family because we have a lot of essential workers in our MAD family. We also have a lot of families who have lost someone during the season. And so there needs to be a place for us to express the racial injustices that are happening, to express the impact of COVID, and to also give a platform for those who have lost someone to be recognized and we can all feel that together. So each of the classes are going to make a music video of their dances from age two through our dance ministry classes. So all of it and our entire school is gonna be organized to do movie. Like we're I creating a movie. movie. I've never done that Just before. a little bit, but just so I can repeat what you're uh, saying. But I do think <laughs> just, I think you're breaking up this bit. I'm just gonna repeat a I'm just gonna repeat what I think I heard for you say which is us to still pre present. Oh hold on one second, Darby. So I think what Darby has in said so far is way make good use of I, I think you're breaking up just one second. Let's I just want to make sure everyone's caught a hold of what you're sharing. So, so far, Darby has shared that they are doing making a documentary to really honor the times. She's talked about the racial injustices of our time, the um, the COVID-19 epidemic, both really global pandemics, right? That, um, that her students are feeling the impact of that and her families. And they are planning music videos. There we go. We're planning music videos that will then coalesce into a documentary to really kind of um, canonize the time and also have something to celebrate at the end of the performance. So Darby's gonna, I think, log out and come right back in. 
So I'm gonna go back and look for her. And, um, and so that's really important to be able to make sure that students and families have opportunities to continue to celebrate the work that it takes to be excellent in our art forms, that that celebration doesn't go away, um, even though um, we're all dealing with, well, a pandemic, a, glo a global pandemic, something we none of us have ever experienced before. Uh, while we're waiting for Darby to rejoin us, Sonia or Nicole, will you tell us um, what are some of the things that we need to keep in mind in terms of even when schools reopen, should schools continue to think about offering hybrid performances so that families can participate remotely? Definitely. I, th I think that that's something um, to carry forward in terms of being able to reach more people um, through a virtual platform. Um, certainly, you know, there are restrictions in terms of who has access, but um, being able to uh, document a performance and share it um, in a wide way is something that we have, you know, should in embrace, in my opinion. And Nicole, feel free to add. Absolutely. I was just thinking like this whole experience has, has challenged those of us, you know, that maybe hadn't explored technology as much as others. And I think becoming a little more savvy in, in these um ways to communicate has allowed us to cast a larger net and, and reach more people. Um, so I think while this has been traumatizing, I think it really has changed things moving forward. And I think we'll have that different lens moving forward of how we can reach more people. So I'm, I'm excited for that component. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. Of course. And I'm getting ready to bring up Amber, but Sonia and Nicole, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your work on the Arts Together report. And we look forward to hearing more from you both. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you. All right. I'm going to say we're going to invite Darby and Amber to come up and join us on stage. And so I've got Amber coming up. And I'm going to throw out a, an invite to Darby as well. OK. Hello, across the bridge. <laughs> well, hello. Greetings from Queen Anne's. <laughs> it's so great to see you. So we've got Amber right here, who is our newly pronounced Teacher of the Year Yay. for Queen Anne's County Public Schools. What a thrilled to have you with us. Thank you. It's so nice to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. So you've shared some, I think, student videos, which we'll play while we're talking. Yeah. Great. Yep. Sounds great. Thank you. Of course. So Amber, will you talk to us a little bit about what is ahead, right? <laughs> oh my gosh. What a whole time. So how has remote learning really impacted your teaching and learning with your students? Oh my gosh, Alicia, if you had asked me in December, could I teach dance remotely? I'd have been like, no way. There is no way I could do this. You know, it's all about placement and alignment and how could I do that? I'm not there. But in March, when it was a life or death situation, literally, I was like, I got this. <laughs> I can do this, <laughs> you know, because my life depended on it, right? Wow. So I kind of just dug my heels in and said to my students, come on, we're going to do this. And they were on board. And, you know, we, we did what we had to do, right? So what you're watching right now is Abby, my sweet girl, Abby. And then you have Gabby there. And they just were up for the challenge. My supervisor, Mr. Bell, uh, sent out a challenge for all of us to do this High Hopes video. And it was just awesome. And these two girls said, sure, we can do this. And for 15 seconds, they danced wherever they wanted to, to dance. And they just really poured their hearts and souls into, um, you know, this, this challenge. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so remote learning, it's, it's presented some challenges, but it's also, or obstacles, but it's also presented some positive results. So one of the obstacles or challenges that we had was just uh, relationships. Like my whole teaching existence is built around relationships. 
but I'm not there, right? So I had this disconnect with my students. I wasn't there to ask about the softball game or ask about indoor track or, I mean, uh, track outside. So, you know, there was this disconnect with relationships. And so that was really uh, impactful. Just the other night, I had a student text to me, you know, in tears Mm. because she didn't feel like she was good enough. You know, she didn't feel like she had it to go on to college. And all that is stems from not being around her support, you know, because we as dance teachers, what do we do? We give that constant feedback, that immediate feedback. We're, girl, you got it. Boy, turn faster, go faster, jump higher. You know, we're always there. We're doing it, right? We're on. That's right. Your students just haven't had that from us. And it's really has caused us caused some doubt, which is unfortunate. Um, Some of the other things, though, uh, with remote learning, uh, one of the projects that I gave, I said, you know what? Let's involve the whole family. So what you're about to watch is a young lady and her sister and her dog. And they uh, completed the project that I asked them to do. I think it was um, describe some right or some wrong ways of Uh, you can handle yourself in the dance studio. So this was a dance one project and the whole family got involved. And even, you know, later on, the the young lady, Grace, the older lady, the older student said, my sister really enjoyed being in in the video with me. So it was really an exciting kind of time. And then lastly, uh, one of the I guess you could say assignments that I had that I thought was really cool, as Tamisha talked about earlier, was our sight dancing, right? And so here's Sweet Logan, and he's going to dance here in his kitchen. He is I our musical. <laughs> he is our musical theater young man, and whoop, there he goes, right? He is bringing it, and he said this was by far the best assignment I had ever given, and he just he just took it all in. He embraced it for what it was. And he went for it. So incredible. Is that something? So that's just, you know, just sort of some ways that uh, remote learning has impacted us as far as just relationships, as far as, you know, just being there, giving that immediate feedback. It's really been kind of difficult. Uh, another thing that I have found, and I'm sure it's not, again, unique to just me or Queen Anne's County, I had a student like email me and say, gosh, Miss Wright, I would love to do the work that you're giving, but my mom is a nurse. My stepdad just went to rehab. I have to take care of my twin sisters. At the end of the day, I'm exhausted. Like, I just don't have time to do this. Yeah. So so my heart, you know, goes out to students who were in that kind of um, situation. So this social, emotional learning piece, that is out there for us, that that you all have created for us, it is so important to the psyche of our students, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, um, oftentimes a trauma-informed approach is something that we reserve um, in conversations around um, students from urban school districts. Yes. And so, um, but, you know, healing-centered education works for everyone. Mm-hmm. And, and and arts teachers know that better than anyone else. Yes. I really do believe that. Um, and so I'm excited to uh, this summer embark with um, with anyone who will join us to learn more deeply about social emotional learning, about culturally responsive pedagogy, and the ways that it can show up in arts ed, anti bias education. Yes. The ways we can all be there to support our students. Um, we'll be offering courses like mental health first aid for youth. Um, a Maryland micro credentials exploring the, the creative process. And so this is all really important. Over 126 hours of professional learning will be offered for free this yeah. summer for Maryland arts educators and Maryland educators. So this is a really important time. Uh, Amber, will you talk to us since we're on the topic of professional learning? First off, I want to say thank you for sharing those beautiful images of your students. <laughs> thank you. So nice um, to be able to see students. Um, uh, and see students just thriving in a creative space and making and doing is, I think, life affirming and helps us all. So we're very grateful to you and your students for those specimens and artifacts of joy. So thank yeah. you. You're welcome. Thank you. 
Uh, will you talk to us about your summer? You yes. are, of course, the teacher of the year for Queen Anne's County <laughs> School. Yes. Uh, and so what are you planning this summer? And even tell us about the rest. We hope that part of it includes rest and relaxation. Um, but what are you planning this summer um, to prepare for fall 2020? Yep. So as uh, Nicole and, and Sonia talked about, you know, I, I read that document on the Arts Together, you know, that guide, and I was overwhelmed. I thought, oh my gosh, I have a lot of work to do, right? So I'm thinking, how am I, how am I going to get the students in the space? What is that going to look like? Six feet apart, you know, am I going to put, you know, tape down, you know, boxes, tape down? What is it going to look like? So I'm going to spend part of my sun summer um, just figuring out logistics. Mm -hmm. Like like I think Nicole said, how are they going to enter the room? How are they going to exit the room? How are we going to go across the floor for, for progressions? I mean, something so simple, where are they going to change their clothes? Yeah. <laughs> you know, because again, they have to be, you know, six feet apart. And then on top of that, I'm going to think about, now, how are we going to clean everything? Who's going to clean it? I don't think they can clean it. So I've got to, you know, so just little, little things like that. Um, I'm going to take time, breathe and figure it out. Yeah. Uh, I don't expect my administration to do that for me. They don't know the space the way I do. Right. They don't know how I work through the space. So I need to take the time to figure that out and then share it with them. That's I think that. Yeah, I think that that's fair to them I, I and, and fair to my students. Absolutely, absolutely. Our yeah. local school systems will have some, will have, of course, guidance for teachers, um, but that does have to be always filtered through uh, an arts lens, right? Arts yeah. classes are different. And so we'll work together, um, I think, as a community to really give each other advice on um, how to work within the parameters our local school systems have yes. set up. Yeah, and I really, I don't mean to cut you off, Alicia. I well, really... Wait. I really appreciate the document that was sent out or the, the guidelines. It, it really is so very, very helpful. And I was just talking to Mr. Bell about this the other day, my supervisor, Mr. Bell. Yeah. And I was just sharing with him that I thought it would be so wonderful if there was just like a, a quick page, you know, for other performing arts teachers to just reference for, you know, just quick little lessons, you know, maybe three big topics and then little le uh, lessons that we could just go back and reference if we needed to. So I hope to be a part of that and write some of those quick pages. Um, I think Kristen Tyler is the other day, we only have two high schools. <laughs> Okay. In, our, in our county, county. Okay. So Kristen Tyler and I, I hope to we'll get together so we can actually write some remote learning um, or write remote learning curriculum, uh, just for our, of course, just for Queen Anne's County. But you know, we really want to get out there and be ahead of it, so that our administrators don't have to say, "What do you think?" We can right. say, "This is what we think." We got a plan. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Right. And again, it takes something off of their plate. So this is to help them. But it also helps us to kind of um, shape and mold what's best for us and our teaching styles and our students' learning styles. Absolutely. I think that's such a key part. You know, we're really advising that as schools begin to develop committees, of course, yeah. will help with scheduling and figuring out distancing and for school procedures that the arts teams in every building are consulted and a part have a voice in those teams because we know our programs best. Yeah. Yes. Darby, what are you planning for? <laughs> Darby, Mac, what are you planning for this summer? How are you planning for just for yourself? What are, what's kind of, what's some of the learning that you want to make sure you're getting so that you can show up for your students um, in fall with some new new skills and tools? Well, um, I think the biggest thing is just for us to be mindful of parents' readiness to come back into the yes. space and that we still are leaving us an opportunity for children to learn from home if that's comfortable for them and the kids are ready to come back in. But I've given a, a little bit of playroom for my teachers, for myself and for my parents and the children that if they choose to still want to engage online, they can. Um, we have restructured our classrooms and installed TVs and webcams in them so that we can do a hybrid model. Um, and we are figuring that out now outside. So right now we're offering outdoor in-person classes where we see the kids for all of their classes, but we also still engage with them online if they choose to log in from home. Yeah. What we are finding is that with the change of the new normal, uh, 
accessibility is important and mm -hmm. convenience is important. Mm. So com parents who may work and can't get their kids to class will opt to log in from home and still have class. Um, we're trying to figure out what the rule system around that will look like because I, in a meeting I said, no, it's not supposed to be because you don't feel like bringing your child to dance today that you're going to access online. But so we're just trying to figure out the logistics behind it. But I think the biggest thing is just being able to balance the hybrid method or the model and for my teachers to feel confident and not crazy teaching to the screen and teaching to a room full of students yeah. at the same right. time. Right. What look like. I just don't think that this is going away. And I think we do need to adapt and be very mindful of how to accommodate everybody as we transition either into a deeper version of this or out of it and back to what we would consider normal. Um, it's just a lot of replanning and re retraining. So most of my time this summer will just be about restructuring curriculum to support the hybrid method. Um, what does testing look like in our building? How do we still ensure that they are getting the feedback that they need? Uh, because I did hear that that was a big issue for us as well, the confidence of the student. Now that we've got them back in person, they make the transition back fine. We can see that they've learned while they were taking class online. Some have gotten stronger. Oh, so wow. our students who weren't as uh, confident in the classroom became very confident at home, but we also had some who were super confident in the classroom kind of retract back. And so it's just finding that balance and still encouraging them. We're grateful to see them back in the space, whatever space we deem is, whatever grass space we find available. <laughs> um, <laughs> we're grateful to have them back, but there are days that it rains and we have to go back to our Zoom model for teaching. Mm -hmm. So it's really just about teaching my teachers how to reteach uh, hybrid and in person. I love I love this model that you're sharing out, Derby, because it aligns so clearly with the Maryland State Arts Council's digital engagement mm -hmm. uh, resource, um, which um, I'm sure a link will pop up in a second. Um, but um, but you know they're really suggesting outdoor when possible. They're also yeah. suggesting that we continue to offer hybrid um, resources that we do not implement in any way. We're not we're not punitive to families that decide they're not ready. To um, to break to you know to come back in in public space, especially in large groups, so that we're not punitive with that. You know, I'm, I'm a choir person, so just like you, like attendance matters, and you will get tossed out of an, of a performance if you're not physically present, right? And so we're all wrapping our heads around a new normal around um, what it, what does attendance mean? What does engagement mean? Um, you know, what does showing up look like? And so I'm so excited to see that you guys are adapting so quickly and in such a robust way that feels like it's just centered in families and what families need. Yeah. You guys, this has been an incredible hour. I am so grateful to both of you. you. Um, I think we'll drop a link um, too around the Maryland, Maryland Academy of Dance. So folks can find um, find Darby's program. Um, it is um, an, a wonder. How many students do you guys have there, Darby? Four hundred students, and um, yeah. So <laughs> we, did, we did two and up. Yes, two and up. We start at age two and go through adults. So it is. It's a big baby that needs to be burped and changed very often. Um, but we are definitely creating and still very connected to the Maryland dance education process. It's awesome. our standard in our building, so. Absolutely, well, we're so glad to have you. And Amber, congratulations on being thank awarded Teacher of the Year. Thank you, hey. thank you so much. And I again, thank you for this opportunity. Of course, thank you. I look forward to coming across the bridge to see you and your students soon, all right? All right, everyone, this is, um, we're gonna wrap up. So we just wanna remind everyone that it's so important that we support professional learning for arts educators that build social emotional competence and culturally responsive competence for our educators so that the classrooms uh, that we all apply, arts classrooms, dance classrooms today, can be culturally competent, safe, bold, uh, brave spaces for students. We also want to give teachers tools to confront bias in our curriculum and in our classrooms. Also today, we hear the call to prepare educators for physical distancing procedures and to level up the use of technology and remote learning strategies. So please, you know, we have over 126 hours of professional learning through MSBE. You've heard about JETI through MDEA. And of course, your local school systems are gonna have professional learning available specifically, I know, around technology and sanitization. 
Arts Together calls for professional learning that should be leveraged to increase the capacity of our arts educators. And so we ask you to really dive into that document. Um, if you read nothing else, read the general recommendations and the dance education recommendations. You can give yourself a heads up as to what we can expect in the days ahead. That report will be updated once a month. So you can expect another edition sometime the first week of July. Finance education, as a reminder, is a right, not a privilege. And our Maryland COVID-19 response is really dedicated to expanding opportunities for all students and providing an inclusive pathway forward. So to that end, Maryland finance educators are encouraged to design lessons with all learners in mind, with all communities in mind, and of course, with wellness and healing in mind. So we welcome uh, you to give feedback on that report. We hope that you will download it today and we hope to see you soon. Next week, we will have two more. We have three more of these panels to get through for uh, before we're finished with all five arts disciplines. So next week, you can expect general and instrumental music, which will be all together. And then theater is next Friday. And the following week, you'll see a media arts presentation. So we're grateful to all of you. Thank you for coming to support today. Thank you to all of our presenters. And have a great rest of the day. Bye-bye.